This is a production of Cornell University. My, my video background is actually uh, a virtual background for our second global sustainability conference, which just finished today. And this continued a theme that we've been discussing, uh, well, for a couple of years now in, in, in EFA and the Associated Partners. Uh, really, how to move this entire industry, how it's a whole new, more sustainable industry, including making sustainability part of the core business and not just some greenwashing or corporate social responsibility. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about is, is coming from that angle. Um, but of course, I'm looking at it also from the point of view of science in the sense that uh, I've spent my entire career until now, or until recently, 30 years in essentially public sector research. Yeah, and so I think it's the marriage of science and, and industry thinking that interests me nowadays, uh, because I think that in the end uh, will hopefully make a difference. Yeah. So uh, this new paradigm that I will talk about is not entirely new, uh, but I think uh, what is new is that we've, we have now also this thinking penetrating across the industry. Uh, for those who don't know IFA, so IFA current, its current name is International Fertilizer Association. It had a, a few other names in the past because it's very old, it was uh, founded in 1927 and it is in fact the only global fertilizer industry association. So we have members uh, that uh, produce fertilizers, but also members who just trade it or distribute it or members who do everything, including uh, more downstream uh, services to farmers. Uh, but we also have uh, non-industry members, so research institutes, uh, several SDG centers, or for example, member Rosenstead too, and uh, a number of other associations and, and NGOs. Uh, we have at present about 450, something like that, uh, members in various categories across the world. And they represent, let's say, about 80% of the global fertilizer production. Now, when you look at our vision and mission, it's already stated there that uh, we were not a lobbying organization. We want to promote the efficient and responsible production, distribution, and use of plant and food nutrients. And so and through that, uh, hopefully make it a contribution to a more sustainable agriculture in the world. So this is uh, stated already for quite some time, uh, but um, I think it uh, also goes back to the fundamental story of uh, modern agriculture and fertilizer. So this is the slide from our Rossumstead time, which I like going because uh, on one side, it pretty much um, summarizes what has happened in one way or another in different reincarnations throughout the world in the last uh, 150 or so years. Yeah. Uh, what's interesting is that the value of nutrients as a whole and the fertilizer in particular was already demonstrated uh, in this experiment 175 years ago. Yeah. I mean, you can see that uh, uh, in this graph, there are the two lines here, the pink one or whatever the color is here and this dark violet one here are the ones with nutrient input. Uh, one is uh, manure, farmyard manure in those days and the other one is a full uh, dose of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and a few other things. You know. And you can see that uh, with just by doing this, uh, you could triple years uh, already back in the uh, 19th century. Yeah. And that's just what it was for a long time, until after 1960, roughly speaking, we had the general ingredients of the Green Revolution that are also shown in this uh, graph here, where you can see Yields are rapidly going up uh, in continuous wheat here, up to about six, seven tons nowadays, uh, due to the short straw varieties. The Capel was the first one that came in high yielding stuff. But if you move to uh, wheat and go in a rotation, you could then also uh, double the yields further. And nowadays, uh, they are harvesting routinely about 12 tons of yield in this experiment. And there's a succession of other succession of other changes uh, in technologies that took place. And so fertilizer, I think, as we all know, uh, has been 
first a key ingredient of this green revolution, but also actually a driver for many other things then too, and vice versa. So it's a never ending succession of the technology and this has happened uh, uh, throughout the world. Yeah. Now, my entry into agriculture happened in 1977, you know, when I was a 16 year old uh, young boy, I guess, you know, in, in East Germany and decided to embark on a three-year apprenticeship. And you could learn in those days a, a profession that was called agricultural chemist or agrochemist. You know, these were times when we all got excited about these things. You know. uh, I actually drove all of these machines so that you can see on this slide, except for this airplane, because uh, you needed special security clearance. It was a very popular means for escaping to West Germany, and only a few people could fly it. So, but all of the other ones uh, I did. And uh, it was the time when young people got very excited about uh, modern agriculture because you got to drive big fancy machines. And uh, you didn't really worry too much about what we, what we were doing, you know, so what we were actually spraying or, or spreading on these uh, fields. It all seemed right uh, and was uh, the spirit of time to increase yields, as you will notice. Uh, Fertilizer spreaders in those days even made it um, the postage stamps in this country. Imagine trying this today. So this is how I got into this. Yeah, there was, a, if you now would look back, you can see that right away in the middle of this uh, green revolution or intensification that took place also in Europe, in irrespective of whether you lived in a capitalist or a communist country, it happened everywhere. So. The problem with this approach obviously was that uh, we have uh, created a world that nowadays from a nutrient point of view looks like this. So it's essentially a global nutrient imbalance, which you can see for many nutrients, but particularly for nitrogen, but also for phosphorus to some degree in the same way. Um, so we have uh, large surpluses in, in some parts of the world. You can see that in uh, China, for example, Northern India over here, parts of Europe, parts of North America, and now also emerging parts in, in South America. Uh, and we have, on the other hand, huge parts of the world in which we have uh, deficits uh, or uh, at best uh, very small surpluses, uh, which uh, essentially are also neutral balances. And these situations, uh, uh, essentially mean that you're mining the soil for nutrients. So this whole picture got, of course, uh, further uh, exaggerated through the emerging and growing international trade of food and feed items and the nutrients along with this. And so we've really created uh, a situation now that is not easy to correct. Uh, so on one side, the surpluses that create massive environmental issues of that kind, and then the other side, deficits or, or uh, no uh, applications that uh, create environmental problems and uh, human problems of other kinds. Yeah. So this is the real issue that we are facing. And I think um, uh, this is now, from my observation, also thinking in uh, very much uh, into industry. Uh, and not just now, but uh, Already, already for quite a few years. Uh, so this is a slide that I took from uh, a Yara Investors uh, Relations Seminar um, given by the Yara CEO uh, in December. I have a link down here uh, where you can watch the whole seminar. And it's actually very interesting to watch, in which she essentially lays out uh, how Yara, as one of the world's leading uh, fertilizer companies, is trying to transform itself you know, from originally being essentially an asset producer who just sold what they produced back in the early 20th century, to then developing more own products and building a reputation. And then in more recent times, moving on to a more crop focused approach and uh, more farmer centric solutions. So becoming a crop nutrition company rather than just a producer company or commodity producer. And now the next stage is essentially to move on to climate neutral solutions. And throughout the entire uh, nutrient chain from the way you produce uh, things uh, on fertilizers in this particular case to how you use them 
uh, including uh, recycling of things. So this is a massive uh, transformation and it's not uh, happening on its own. It's very much uh, a business need nowadays. Uh, so it's driven by, often also by an investor pressure besides the public and societal pressure that always exists. But it's also, I think, increasingly driven by employees, essentially employees in the company who want companies to become more sustainable businesses. You, you need to pay attention to this too. So I could show similar ambitions for a number of the world's leading fertilizer companies. Uh, but I, I just want to make the point here that this is not a one-off thing. Uh, this has become ingrained now in the industry and it's very interesting to watch this uh, particularly for someone like me who has been acting uh, interacting with the industry for about 25 years and always has complained about a lot of sort of stagnation and unwillingness to innovate but uh, this is now a much more interesting time so in this process uh, a few years ago, IFA did a number of exercises, a vision exercise, and then two years ago, nearly two years ago, uh, we had our first high-level forum, one and a half years ago, in which this uh, was spelled out further. And there was, for the first time, a mentioning of the word, okay, moving toward a new paradigm for sustainable plant nutrition. And it was phrased from the industry perspective at that time as, okay, both productivity and food security are still very critical needs to, to not neglect because we still have these issues in many parts of the world and the world population is growing. But a new paradigm for plant nutrition must embrace a food systems approach with all of its sustainability dimensions, including greenhouse gas emissions, uh, reduction, pollution, biodiversity, waste and nutrient recycling and uh, nutrition and health. Mm -hmm. So, and in this document, which you can download if you want, uh, more discussion is made about, okay, what could be specific things that industry can do and what others need to be done, need to get done. So, but it was uh, an eye opener and we have since then continued this process. So earlier, uh, last year, in uh, early 2020, uh, we set up a, a new a think tank, uh, which is called the Scientific Panel on Responsible Plant Nutrition, uh, or SBRPN. And the first task that in the think tank that we set ourselves was, uh, can, can we think about elaborating a bit more, also from a scientific point of view, about this new paradigm for plant nutrition? Uh, what, what, what are the key issues that it needs to address? What can be done about those who need to do what and what in principle would success look like within sort of a human generation time frame? So now it came this uh, issue brief, which we released in November, just or just before Christmas, uh, and which is now also gone in as a submission to the ongoing discussions for the Food System Summit 2021. Mm -hmm. So I will uh, now talk a bit more about what's in this uh, paper, but of course, I can only touch on some of the things. And uh, we're still working on a longer, uh, much more in-depth version that hopefully will be published in a couple of months. So what are some of the issues that we see from a, from a plant nutrition point of view, from a global scale view? So the first one is this one here, uh, which is, you know, is it possible in the future to decouple growth in agricultural production or productivity growth from the growth in fertilizer consumption, which is one of the issues in terms of needing to overcome this global nutrient imbalance. So what we have is a situation that you can see that on this graph here, uh, that the cropland nitrogen input in this case, just for cropland, the orange uh, circles uh, has risen fast. And uh, the gap uh, to the cropland nitrogen output uh, has remained large or even going a little further. Yeah. And so the surplus uh, keeps going on a global scale. And so then the question becomes, uh, if this would continue for many more decades, and then of course, we continue adding 
more to the surplus, more to the nitrogen excess load, uh, and anything that comes along with that from an environmental point of view. So is it possible to, in the future, decouple that in those places uh, where there is excess use, and essentially reallocate some of this to those places that need it? The second issue that we put up front is Africa. Yeah. So what, what does it take uh, to double or triple crop yields in Africa uh, with an increasing in balanced and, and use of nutrients? So this is data from, from our own uh, nutrient uh, use uh, database at IFA, where we have done nutrient budgets uh, on a national scale basis for the whole world since 1961. And um, what you can see there is, uh, this is for nitrogen, phosphorus, and uh, potassium uh, for the whole of uh, uh, Africa. We have essentially a situation that crop removal by far, by far for all of these uh, uh, exceeds uh, the input that comes from fertilizer and manure usually, yeah. and a little bit of nitrogen fixation. Yeah. So this leads then to, High looking or apparently high looking nutrient uh, use efficiencies, uh, if you calculate them as outputs over inputs. You know. um, but what these actually represent, if you get efficiencies of uh, greater than one, then you're mining the soil. And that's what's happening in Africa. So for us, you know, this is a massive issue. Uh, average total use of N, D, and K in sub-Saharan Africa is now about 20 kilos per, per hectare in terms of all nutrients together. And only four or five countries um, uh, exceed 50 kilos, uh, not including South Africa. So they have a long way to go there. And these nutrients can simply not come from any other sources because those don't, don't exist either. You know, so Africa is, from a nutrient point of view, uh, undoubtedly the biggest challenge in the world. Uh, in the paper, we discuss uh, briefly uh, eight other issues. I uh, don't have time now to go through each of those, but some of it I'll indirectly come back to. You know, so, uh, more about all the, so the new kind of data driven technologies and business solutions uh, that may finally lead to more uh, precise nutrient management solutions. Can we solve? Uh, or in other ways, would use nutrient losses and waste along the whole agri-food chain. Yeah. How can we close the nutrient cycles in crop and livestock farming in particular? What can really be done to improve soil health? Mm -hmm. Already starting with a better definition of it, I guess. Uh, how should one manage uh, crop nutrition in, in changing climates? Uh, there's both uh, positive and negative interactions associated with that. Mm -hmm. What are some realistic targets for reducing fertilizer-related uh, greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, not being talked about, but what's actually doable? Uh, how can we design cropping systems to deliver higher quality, more nutritious food? And then the last one is uh, very much uh, about the need to better monitor uh, nutrients and through that also track things and achieve higher levels of uh, sustainability stewardship across the whole chain. So we then uh, went on uh, and tried to come up with a, a general this, uh, definition of what we mean with responsible plant nutrition or new paradigm for this. Yeah. So, and that's written here. So first of all, it needs to follow a food systems and circular economy approach. Mm -hmm. So really that more holistic thinking. And within that uh, uh, incorporate an array of uh, know-how from different uh, disciplines um, to directly and indirectly uh, influence the production, utilization, and recycling of mineral nutrients in these systems. And through that, hopefully achieve more integrated targeted plant nutrition solutions that minimize all of these uh, trade-offs between productivity, environment, and health. And on top of that, they have to be viable in the farmers and business world in different regions. So that's roughly speaking what we mean. And uh, we uh, identified the five uh, overarching uh, objectives or aims of this. You can see them on the left here. So that's just a different way of expressing what was said before. So we must ensure 
uh, continue productivity growth and efficiency growth, but also resilience to climate stresses and other things. We do need to uh, reduce emissions and, and other environmental impact. Uh, we do need to achieve better nutrition and health. We do need to achieve better soil health, and we have to massively increase the uh, nutrient recovery and recycling from many different waste uh, streams. So if we were able to achieve all these five things, then I think we, on the whole, would have a much more sustainable form of, uh, of, of nuclear management across the world. And then we looked at the six uh, actions. Um, and I'm going to talk about these actions now a little bit more for the rest of my talk. Yeah. So I thought this the first one, uh, sustainability-driven nuclear policies and business models that need to be tailored to specific food systems in every country. And what this really means is uh, that one needs to recognize that the targets and roadmaps for managing nutrients uh, will vary, usually depending on a country's position, where the, where the country currently is in terms of nutrient use and use efficiency, and where it could be for that good, for that reason, then within a desired time frame. Uh, this is a graph that is sometimes shown as, as a to illustrate this. So you can think of the evolution uh, in three sort of stages in terms of uh, nutrient use efficiency in a crop or nitrogen use efficiency in particular, calculated as uh, the ratio of output over input. Yeah. So typically, uh, when we have very little uh, use of fertilizer or nutrient input, uh, and so on the x-axis, this is expressed as relatively low crop yield and low economic development. Uh, we also tend to have high use efficiency, uh, and that's the situation uh, that we have in Africa, but it actually means uh, the mining of nutrients or nitrogen from the soil in this case. And as countries intensify um, and also progress along the economic development, uh, usually we see an increase in nutrient use lead to a decline in efficiency, an increase of the surplus, the red line, uh, and followed by a period uh, C where then technology improvements, uh, policy and regulatory pressure come in to finally create the necessary incentives to do better. And as a result of that, uh, nutrient use efficiency rises again and surpluses decline. I've indicated roughly where some of the world's major countries uh, or nutrient consuming countries and regions is on this curve right now. Uh, but what it makes clear is that uh, we are in the very different situations in, in all of these regions. And therefore, uh, when we think about target roadmaps, policies, plans, investments, these will differ quite a bit. It is also important to remember that there are practical limits to both the nutrient use efficiency and the surplus that can be achieved. Uh, so you cannot hope that it will go down to completely zero uh, for the surplus um, and to one for the efficiency because uh, that is often uh, physically or biophysically not desirable or possible even. So one of the implications of this is that to do this and also then to get a better handle on target setting, uh, one really needs to have these uh, indicators. Uh, and so this is one that uh, I've been part of the European Nitrogen Expert Panel a few years ago. We, we set ourselves to ask, can we come up with a simple uh, an, uh, indicator for nitrogen use efficiency that is based on all of the inputs at the farm gate uh, and outputs uh, that go in? Yeah. Uh, that are of importance for the overall nutrient balance, also in terms of what then are the consequences for air and water influences. And can we then find a way to express this indicator in a meaningful way that is also then enables us to uh, specify desired ranges? So, what you can see here is that uh, an output is essentially the equivalent of crop yield. Mm -hmm. And an input is fertilizer and manure, other things. And uh, from a crop point of view, and from a nutrient point of view, we would like to be in this wide range here, uh, anywhere in this uh, bizarre range, which would represent 
the best combination of high nitrogen use efficiency. This is a 90% line here, uh, combined with uh, high yield uh, and a relatively low risk of uh, uh, nitrogen, excessive nitrogen surplus, and also no risk of mining the soil. So this is still a little bit too complicated to understand often, also to communicate. And so, but you can simplify this message then uh, also for uh, then to talk to farmers and policymakers into literally three crop production scenarios. So if your nitrogen use efficiency is over 90, then obviously you're mining the soil and do something to avoid this. If you're in the 50 to 90 percent range, this is quite desirable and you're probably quite balanced. Um, uh, but if you there's also a range where if you're lower than 50 percent, very definitely inefficient, you got to do much more about optimizing your nitrogen applications. So I'm just showing this as one example for the kind of uh, relatively simple but also scientifically quite sound indicators that we need uh, to then also have the ability to set more differentiated targets and interventions. This is what I showed here in the previous uh, graph. Oops, sorry, it was for uh, crop production, but you would already have uh, different ranges for uh, crop livestock system uh, or for grassland. The second action uh, is one that I've spent probably most of my own scientific career on, and that is really how to get knowledge driven solutions and novel technologies that in theory should enable us to tailor nutrient formulations and applications to local needs in a much more precise manner, but how to upscale those to millions of farmers. And this is always the thing that has eluded us. We have usually been able to come up with interesting things, but then how to scale those up uh, into digitally supported advisory systems and make them really integrated business solutions uh, is probably one of the biggest challenges. Now, I have two pictures here on the side. You know, one is the lowland rice systems in Asia. You can see the small fields. And the other one is uh, from some upland systems in, in Africa. And you see the uh, same kind of variable patterns. You know? So, but of course, the solution for each of these systems will be probably quite different. You can still probably follow certain similar scientific principles at least. Now, this brings us then to essentially the question of how to make this part of the precision agronomy approach uh, in which you get need to get the small skills right to make a big difference. And as Andy knows, I keep, when I talk about these things, I, I always say, okay, there are really only 10 to 20 specific management decisions in a crop cycle that from an agronomic point really matter mm -hmm. in, in these nine categories uh, that, uh, that I've listed. There are strategic practices that one way or, or another require a change in behavior. And if you can change uh, support this change in behavior by coming up with the right kind of data metrics and targets for each of these decisions, and the ability to implement each at high quality in the field, then you will have a successful agronomic system. So the problem, I think, is that um, many of us uh, have been working on individual components of this, and it'd be very difficult to bring all this together uh, into the bigger picture, and then also come up with the tools to, to really support this. So my own work uh, on this, uh, started in the early 1990s at Erie um, in many countries in Asia, when we developed this concept of uh, site-specific nutrient management for smallholder farmers, first in rice, but later then also in wheat and maize. And now it's actually been done, uh, particularly also in China, for over 20 crops following very much the same approach that, that we came up with in the 1990s. So you can see that uh, conceptual approach on the right. So you, you have to, one way or another, in a crop rotation or a cropping system, make pre-emergence and post-emergence decisions on managing nutrients uh, and uh, governing forces uh, on those from the outside, uh, besides uh, the uh, more system in, uh, in build determinants. You know? So this 
becomes a complex decision process for any farmer to do. And if, if you have ever grown a crop yourself, uh, I can assure you, you, it's not easy to make these decisions. I've had a habit of growing crops myself, both at Erie and later also at Rossumstead uh, every year because uh, I wanted to know how, how to do these things. And I would say uh, in 50% of the years, I got it right and the other 50% I didn't. Mm -hmm. Even by using pretty sophisticated scientific knowledge and a few tools that I have. So what this work has shown over 25 years is that in major crops like rice, wheat, and maize, uh, these are the benefits that we can typically get, 10 to 20% more yield and profit, 10% less nitrogen fertilizer use, 30 to 50% higher efficiency, less greenhouse gas emissions, uh, nutrient mining, less disease problems. Uh, we have a, a paper, um, a meta analysis of this work right now in submission, which uh, has come up with these numbers. Uh, uh, so what I would say is that this is pretty robust performance uh, under very diverse farming conditions in, in Asia and Africa. Uh, so you won't find too many things that can give you this performance. And there's been families of software apps uh, that, that developed to support this, uh, the Iris family of uh, Rice crop manager for different countries and IPNI, or formerly IPNI, is family of nutrient experts uh, software solutions for different crops and countries. So, lots of good work has gone into it, but nobody has really been able to scale this up beyond a few thousand farmers, basically. There are many reasons for this. Uh, one is probably that the whole approach is too, too complicated. It's too, needing a lot of data or asking lots of questions until you come up with a decision. Other reasons are more of the kind, okay, uh, it's never been really integrated well enough into business uh, systems. So, and if you don't have businesses supporting these things, uh, then from one way or another, you just don't reach the scale. The national extension systems tend to be too weak to achieve all that. You know? So there may be in some countries, no incentives to do better because the government is paying unreasonable fertilizer subsidies, for example, in India. So many different reasons. So one hope that I have, and it may be just a dream, is that maybe we can take some of the complexity out in the future by uh, making these uh, uh, tools more like self-learning fertilizer recommendation and guidance tools throughout the life cycle of a crop and for a whole cropping system. So and that's where I believe that uh, artificial intelligence and other data-driven approaches can play an increasing role. And so maybe allowing us one day to go from the stages where we are at present, which is more of a descriptive analytics and diagnostics approach with a lot of sort of human interaction, then all the way down to a more prescriptive analytics and automated decision approach. And to the extent possible, take the human out of the decision out of the complexity so that it becomes a simple but robust uh, agronomic decision. And then perhaps, uh, and one that self updates uh, over, the, over every year based on the data collected, then one may be at a stage where these things are much more scalable. Maybe it's a dream, but uh, that's part of a new paradigm to me. There are also new data sources uh, that one way or another could play a role. Uh, so one of my other hats is the mentioned and um, we have released recently this new 30 meter resolution digital storm up for the whole of Africa. So now this does not replace the need to be in the field because what you get there is uh, just in any kind of mapping approach an estimate uh, for that 30 meter pixel and an uncertainty around this estimate in this case because it was based on ensemble machine learning so, but at least it gives you perhaps one uh, level of resolution more that gets you closer to the scale where you would want to uh, look at agronomy rather than just something for some. You know? So how to use this sort of type of uh, digital information and other stuff that's nowadays available in the context of these self-learning precision farming solutions for smallholder farmers is for me uh, also another very exciting innovation area in this new paradigm. We want to support this a bit, uh, and we've just created uh, uh, a little new consortium, which we call the Consortium for Precision Crop Nutrition. 
Uh, I've often seen that uh, people accumulate a lot of data or develop proprietary software or algorithms that they don't want to share with anybody. But these things never go anywhere then on their own. Uh, so I think there's a lot more to gain if we can create more open innovation platforms in which it is possible to share data and work together in a pretty competitive mode. Uh, so this is what this is on what I call here the core operating system for methods, data, and digital tools for making good and reproducible fertilizer decisions. The problem right now is that if you give 10 people the same kind of data, you will get 10 different fertilizer recommendations and you still don't know which one is better. Yeah. And that's really, in this day and age, an embarrassment for the whole community, in my opinion. So we've created this consortium, we've just launched it. We have a 28 members so far, eight from industry, nine CG centers, uh, eight universities and research institutes, and three others. So we're, we've started uh, now discussing uh, what we're actually going to do in this space. Uh, but it's one of these mechanisms that I hope can help us to accelerate innovation in that space. Real action is on um, uh, crop livestock integration and greater levels of nutrient recovery and recycling from multiple waste streams. So there is an ideal, idealized uh, picture here, which I redrew from another one that was in a paper in Global Food Security last year, two years ago. You know. So where we really uh, uh, ideally would like to have more integrated crop livestock systems in which animals are being used for what they're good at, for eating grass, for example. You know in which all of the waste uh, from crop production and as well as from the uh, consumer uh, side or from other industrial uh, uh, steps in between goes back into the system and is reutilized. So minimum losses of waste or, or maximum recovery and therefore also far less uh, impact on water and air and other environmental features. We think there is a massive opportunity here uh, from, from the point of uh, view of new technologies that are being piloted already, uh, phosphorus recovery, for example. Uh, in the UK, I worked a lot with uh, a small company that processes pretty much all slaughterhouse waste into a granular mineral fertilizer of your liking. You know, These types of uh, innovations and some of our member companies have also formed partnerships uh, for, for that already. So the Yara, for example, has a partnership Violia, with Veolia, I think they are the world's largest uh, waste uh, processing company. And ICL has a similar partnership in the Netherlands. So big area, uh, it requires a lot of uh, innovation, a lot of good sides, but also the necessary policy incentives to close nutrient cycles, uh, but it could lead to significant reaction in new nutrients beginning to enter the system. You know, if we get the system level, efficiency up through these. Efficient sensitive agriculture is the fourth action. And from our point of view in this new paradigm, it is really uh, focusing on the targeted enrichment and application of fertilizers to deliver micronutrients of importance to crop, animal and human health. So this is where the food system too comes in. So we're not just interested in essential crop nutrients anymore. We really think we need to think about crops as carriers of nutrients for animals and humans. And so iron, zinc, selenium, and iodine uh, play a significant role. Yeah. So there's been various uh, uh, studies of this and partnerships. Uh, I don't want to go through this, uh, but you can see an example for iodine and pop here, uh, where essentially uh, through uh, potassium nitrate and iodine for sprays, uh, it is possible to substantially increase the iodine concentration in wheat grain. And with a relatively modest effort, uh, uh, if you can look at this, uh, uh, how this translates uh, from a single farmer doing this, producing six tons of grain, kind of one and a half hectare, essentially improving the iodine supply of uh, 25 people uh, for a year, for a whole year, through the flour that is being produced in this. These are simple. Um, calculations you can make. Big issue there is two. One, uh, where is this needed and why? 
to targeting needs to be clear and not just sort of doing it for whatever reasons. Um, two, how to mainstream this. You know, so who's going to pay for this? You know, it's very easy or relatively easy to essentially say, okay, all fertilizer needs to contain selenium, you know, like they did in Finland you know, about 20 or 25 years ago, and massively improved the selenium status of the whole Finnish population. So that's a political decision, but uh, in the end, uh, it's mainstreaming either from a political or from a uh, business point of view. And that's where a lot of these good solutions that are available now from an agronomic biofortification point of view haven't really moved far yet. The fifth action that we identified is uh, well, twofold. So it's one, of course, there's still a lot of potential to make fertilizers that are just smarter and better. And there is a lot of um, interest in this, of course, and all the way down to things like nano fertilizers, which I'm still wondering how they actually work. You know? But obviously, that's an innovation area that's common. But the other one is really uh, to change the whole carbon footprint of the fertilizer chain. You know? So, and there, uh, we have a number of opportunities to on the production side, uh, but also on the uh, use side. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the pharma carbon programs that uh, Yara and Lutin have just recently announced, where they want to pay farmers uh, for sequestering carbon in their soils for good practices and actually see this as a new business area, so carbon credit payments. But this area here uh, is very interesting. So blue and green ammonia uh, as a production technology. So the blue ammonia is essentially low carbon footprint ammonia, where through various um, means, you just reduce the carbon footprint uh, of, the, uh, of the whole process. Whereas in green ammonia, you use renewable energy uh, as your energy source and electrolysis and work. And essentially, you can create a zero carbon uh, ammonia. What excites the industry most uh, is not just reducing the carbon footprint of the fertilizer, uh, but in using this new green or low carbon ammonia as a new uh, power source for the hydrogen economy in the world. It, uh, it can use existing infrastructure for storage and transport. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, it can also become a very interesting uh, source, for example, as shipping fuel. So there's a lot of pilot projects in this area, uh, and the first big super tankers are being built uh, on blue beam fields uh, that will be running on these types of things. So this is a whole new area. Uh, right now, if you look at the global fertilizer production, 20% of the ammonia that is being produced goes already into industrial applications of various kinds. So if this becomes uh, another big chunk, then essentially uh, a lot of this will be part of the energy revolution, our energy transformation, the decarbonizing energy systems, uh, not necessarily uh, part of fertilizer industry anymore. And then the sixth action is very dear to my heart. And I'm going to show a few examples of, uh, of this kind. And this is innovation. So I, there's of course the need uh, for generally higher investments in the whole plant nutrition area. It's been an industry which traditionally uh, has a very low levels of R&D investment compared to, for example, the crop protection, seed sector, or life sciences industries. We don't have very good figures, and there are some exceptions in, in companies, but on average, the fertilizer industry uh, traditionally has spent less than 1% of its revenue on R&D. So whereas in crop protection seed sectors, you would be talking more like 10 to 50%, or in some cases, closer to 20%. We have a long way to go in the private sector, and uh, we also have a long way to go in the public sector because I think funding, particularly for more applied plant nutrition research, uh, has dwindled in many parts of the world so for decades already. So there is this, uh, but there's also, I think, in my view, the need to change the way we do science. Yeah, so that we can actually do stuff that is more meaningful without stifling a really fundamental science. 
but also then translate things uh, faster into practice. So I've spent a lot of time uh, also due to my roles at Erie and then later on Ross and thinking about this because we do, everyone does very interesting science, uh, but most of it ends up just in scientific papers or conferences or discussion groups and never see uh, the light of a farmer's field. So I think we can learn a lot in my view uh, from lean innovation concepts that are more typical for the more entrepreneurial startup culture. Uh, the graph on the right is actually taken from the Agile Biofoundry, which is essentially the consortium of um, DOA funded uh, uh, bio labs in the US. You know? So they got together a few years ago to implement uh, this uh, kind of strategy in their world where they felt that uh, um, they none of them had all of the resources to do the entire cycle and therefore it was better to work together and utilize each other's facilities so that you could build, test, learn, or design, build, test and learn uh, much more quicker and actually also be able to scale up. So if you want to scale up, for example, you need the right kind of pilot facilities, which many don't have, you know, but some have. You know. So this kind of rapid innovation cycles in which you learn quickly, uh, in which you also fail quickly when necessary, I admit this, we don't like to fail in science and I don't even publish this often, but in the innovation world, it's perfectly fine to fail because it leads you to on a different path uh, very quickly. Okay? So I've been thinking a lot about how to uh, incorporate these uh, things into the science uh, of a traditional research institution or a university, if you wish. So at Rossumstead, uh, we, for our own purposes, uh, distinguished science and innovation um, in this way. Uh, so science is about discovery, ideas generation, and building the knowledge, invention is about making something. And innovation is the process by which you try to bring these things together. And so your ideas, your previous knowledge and inventions, converting them into um, commercially viable product. You know, so that is then needed if you want to translate things into practice at scale. And you need to have a, also a viable business model along with this. What I've often observed also in the institutions where I've worked, you know, be it Nebraska, Erie, or Rosenstedt, that there is a lot of excellent science, but uh, very poor innovation. So this step here is the one that scientists uh, typically struggle with, which they're either uncomfortable with, or they don't know about it, or they don't want to hear about it, and nobody's there to help them. So at Rosenstedt, uh, when I came to Rosenstedt in 2014, uh, that was the situation, and probably to some extent still is. You know, but, uh, but we had, uh, you know, there you have an institute which at that point was um, 171 years old you know, and uh, had established a massive reputation for excellent research worldwide. You know, and the third year also then have a certain way of doing science you know, in the usual groups and disciplines. And but what I noticed is you know, that. There was a lot of tricks in science, but very little impact. And when I went around the UK and talked to farmers uh, or industry and said, well, can you name one or two things that have come out of Rossumstead that have helped you in, in your business in the last 10 or 15 years, nobody could name anything. And I thought that was really bad because uh, I saw all this very cool work being done by scientists, you know, so it got stuck somewhere. And the problem was, of course, also that the science funding world has changed and does not really support translation of science or any kind of applied stuff anymore. Yeah. Everything has to be excellent. And this also creates then the wrong incentives for scientists. Uh, so what we did at Rossumstead, uh, uh, I asked people to do a self-assessment. Uh, and this is one of the things that came out of it. You know. So besides me, all of the authors on this paper, which we published in Nature Plants as a commentary, are scientists at different ages who have spent most of their scientific career at Rosenstedt only, or a long time of it. So, and I asked them to review a science area which 
none of them was actually working on bioeconomy. And so what came out of this that they all discovered that actually a lot of the stuff that we do fits the needs of bioeconomy. Mm -hmm. So we could actually be a great source of innovations for this, uh, but we would have to make quite some substantial changes in how we do research in, in our culture. This is what they concluded themselves. Uh, so it was actually quite an eye opener. And then we went around and started thinking about uh, what are some interesting models that we could potentially uh, steal from others uh, and adopt to our needs. One place that inspired us a lot was Wetsis in, in the Netherlands, the European Center for Excellence, or of Excellence for Sustainable Water Technology. So they really want to sort of be at the interface of different scientific disciplines. You can see them here. So they have chemistry, physics, technical sciences, life sciences. Uh, they have a fancy innovation facility, uh, but essentially uh, then have three types of projects, imagination project, optimization project, and foundation projects. Uh, and their portfolio, they're aiming to always have about 50% imagination projects. So these are things that are leading to the next technology uh, breakthrough but 15 to 20 percent foundation projects so this would be more risky discovery science and then the rest of the optimization kinds of more incremental research that improves something that already exists you know so that's their philosophy and they have different research themes and the key engine of this are these types of more entrepreneurial phd so everything is done through phd students there you know? Uh, but um, they have a very interesting process. Yeah? So they have a selection process, very rigorous here, yeah? which in, in, involves the university's uh, people as well as the company people that have a particular interest in a certain theme you know? uh, and brings together ideas and then talent. So you, you select for both. And only if it passes through, then this PhD project can uh, go. Each PhD project must have at least one company in it, you know, better two, you know, or some uh, besides the academic partner or partners. So they have supervision from the academic side. So they have companies involvement directly, um, fancy shared facility where everybody can get the stuff they need. And they embed in this um, uh, a whole range of other supporting measures for the students for personal growth, you know, getting the right kind of innovation culture and understanding how things work. So out come then the usual scientific papers, but a lot of applications and patents too, and sometimes some spin out companies. And the other output is of course, a new kind of very clever entrepreneurial student or scientist. Uh, I can encourage you to look at the website a bit more. There's a lot more information there. Uh, so I always thought it was very inspiring. And then we went at Rossum's that uh, and created our uh, own innovation mechanisms. Uh, here's just one example. Uh, so we called it Agria, Agricultural Research Innovation Accelerator. We got together with uh, uh, three other universities, Cranfield University College London and Hartford Group, because uh, these all had scientific expertise and facilities which we did not have, even though we had very good facilities at Rossum set and lots of stuff, but these have a lot of things we didn't have. Like, you know, we didn't, we didn't have an astronomy department or a physics department or a big computer science department you know, or a business school like Frankfurt, you know, but you need these types of things if you want to work in this more innovation oriented manner. And then these are just three different mechanisms. Uh, the short leaps is the main one, uh, where really these are just six month projects for early idea testing. You can get another phase, but you need to demonstrate why. Uh, and then you have other uh, ones uh, that you created. And this would be a innovation student of the Betzos kind, uh, for which we created a whole bunch of those too. So this is part of the culture change process, and they're continuing along those lines. I haven't been there for over a year, but uh, it was not easy uh, to embed this into the existing structures, you know, also because uh, there was no funding for it, and we had to often find new ways of uh, accessing money. Uh, but interestingly, we're also able to get uh, money from uh, venture capital for one of these innovation accelerators. Uh, so I think institutions that work in science should really look at this as an open eye and see how they can 
and really adopt some of these mechanisms in addition or partially replacing the traditional models of uh, how they work. So it is clear that when we want to uh, implement this uh, new paradigm for plant nutrition, it needs to be a coherent effort by uh, many actors. So the blue boxes in this graph are the key actors that really need to do something different. So it's the fertilizer industry, of course, yeah, uh, that has perhaps the main responsibility, but of the farmers and the service providers and advisors. The trade-off process for but even retailers and consumers, and consumers, of course, can do a lot in terms of eating better and wasting less. Uh, this is the massive feedback mechanism there. You know, at all of these stages, we have various uh, ways to reduce emissions or waste or recover and recycle more. Uh, so not just at one or two stages; it happens everywhere. And feed them back into the system either at the industrial stage or at the farming stage. You know, these are big opportunities. And we as scientists typically sit above here and in the supporting gang, uh, along with uh, others that uh, need to create the appropriate mechanisms uh, and also evidence for, for this. So, but I'm hopeful that uh, this more holistic view that is now taken uh, in place will maybe finally help us to make faster progress on some of these things in the past. Uh, this is my last slide. Um, in the paper, uh, we discuss a little bit what would success look like, and we actually make nine example concrete points of what, of what would be specific achievements one could imagine uh, by 2040, so one human generation from now. So I'm going to skip those, I'm not going to explain them, but what essentially uh, the outcome should be is in a societal plant nutrition optimum, and not just a pure economic plant nutrition optimum, the kind that we had until now. So I think that's uh, the overarching uh, approach behind this, and I'll be happy to answer any questions now. Johannes, go ahead. Johannes, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Achim. Thank, Thank, Thank you very much for your. For your. Well, there is somewhere. Uh, Feedback. Yeah, now it's gone. Um, thank you for your uh, for your presentation. Um, I was wondering. Um, you, I was really pleased seeing that you mentioned circular economy and and put a lot of emphasis on on a new generation of of um, uh, fertilizers. Um, I, I was wondering. Uh, there, the inconvenient truth is that we are flushing more uh, nutrients down the toilets, um, collectively speaking, as we are applying uh, to agricultural fields in many, many, if not most countries in the world. Um, so uh, how, uh, with, with your goal six especially, how uh, can we uh, broach a conversation with fertilizer companies that they should actually morph from a mining company to a recycling company? to figure out how we can recycle excreta from humans and animals back to agriculture? Or is that something that's already happening or is this futile? It's already happening. So we have uh, just three months ago created a new task force on nutrient recovery and recycling within EFA. We never had this before, you know, because you know, fertilizer companies want to produce new fertilizer and sell it, you know, so, but we have this now. And uh, when we announced it, it raised actually a, a lot of interest. We have a lot of uh, team members. Uh, we've also created a whole new committee called sustainability, uh, which we never had before. You know? so, so the interest is there, I think. Uh, and we have a number of companies who, besides mineral fertilizers, already would use commercial organic fertilizers or organic mineral fertilizers. Mm -hmm. And there's quite a few who uh, are in exploring ways of uh, technologies for, for recovering and recycling. So at, at different stages of the production process. So that can range from, say, if you're a phosphate mining company like uh, OCP, you know, so you obviously want to reduce to the extent possible your, your waste at the production, at the mining and processing stage. 
and uh, you want to find the use for phosphor gypsum, which uh, sits in big piles, millions of tons, um, and is actually another valuable product. You know? So, but then other companies are focusing more on uh, municipal waste streams. Uh, so that's what the Yara Veolia uh, collaboration, I think, is mainly about that. That's city waste, essentially, you know. And and there are some, I think, that are more into the question of uh, uh, what do you do with processing manure from large livestock facilities. Yeah. The irony with that, of course, is that that works best if you have very large concentrated livestock facilities, <laughs> which nobody really likes either, you know. <laughs> so, uh, but in the European Union, there is a new standard being discussed called Renewal, uh, which is recovered nitrogen from manure and something. So the idea there is basically to make uh, bulky biomass waste into mineral grade type of fertilizers. Yeah. So that is what you really need to uh, have a product that you can then utilize much easier, you know, out over longer distances, you know. And that's where a lot of technology comes in. I think we're still at the early stage. It needs a lot more investment. And there are also a lot of regulatory uncertainties, how to, how to regulate a product like this, you know into the potential contaminants and that sort of stuff. But the industry is definitely very interested and I see this as one of the big growth areas in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Johannes. Uh, Dominic, you have a question. Oh, um, sure. I, I actually lowered my hand because it was kind of related to what Johannes was asking. So maybe I, it was kind of covered, but it's slightly different. So I'll go ahead because I didn't see another, any other hands raised. Um, I'm just wondering a little bit about how we balance the fact that most of the decisions are made at the farm level. And a lot of the tools we're looking at with precision agriculture and management uh, tools are looking at how we improve nitrogen use efficiency at the farm level. But doing that, if you're looking at improving recycling rates of nutrients across a whole food system, is a very different question. So, for example, if you're if you're doing nutrient recovery, you might have a lower nutrient use efficiency for that recovered nutrient than for a pure mineral fertilizer. So, are we optimizing for the wrong thing in driving farms to optimize nutrient use efficiency when we should, in fact, be optimizing across the whole food system for these nutrients? And um, what sort of tools can we do to make sure we're getting the right answer? Oh, I made that quite clear, yeah. I think. Yeah, I, th I, think in, uh, I think we need both, you know. I mean, obviously, uh, there's still a, a lot of room to optimize nutrient use efficiency at the farm scale, and that should still be the priority. I mean, it depends a little bit. I mean, if you're already at, you know, 80% in a very well-managed uh, system, you know, there's not much to optimize anymore. So, but in other places, uh, you know, you may be at thirty percent. Then, of course, there's plenty of space. You know? so, so I, I do. I think we should not lose sight of this. This is still the priority. That's where also the bulk of the losses occur in, in the chain. You know, uh, at least those that directly and you know, hit the water and, and the air. You know, so well, I think that's right. You know, I think the recycling issue um, is is part of the more food chain nutrient use efficiency thinking. You know. And when people do food chain calculations, they usually conclude, well, you know, the food chain use efficiency is very, very low, you know. Now, of course, um, there's also many stages in this food chain that are difficult to address, you know, and not uh, easy controllable. You know? So how, how much realistically of that further end of the chain you can actually improve compared to the beginning of the chain, the production and the cropland use, was one of the open questions to me myself. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's, it, we need both, you know. So. Great, thank, thank you, Dominic. Uh, thank you, Akim. Uh, so we are, we are over time now. So I'm going to close the, the, the seminar as such and offer Akim our thanks. It's kind of awkward to do this uh, on Zoom, but uh, I know that your presentation is deeply appreciated. Lots of people are, are writing about that. 
Thank you so much. Um, we're going to stay on. Okay, I know what time is it there for you now? It's it's fairly it's late. Not late. It's only uh, half past seven. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's not, it's not <laughs> as late as I thought. So uh, we're going to keep the the Zoom open for you know twenty minutes or half an hour just for for some informal discussion. So anybody who would like to stay on for that, um, please uh, please do so. And uh, thanks again, Aki. It was really tremendous, uh, tremendous presentation. It gives us a lot to think about. Why don't we take a two minute break? just so that uh, everyone can get up and stretch and we'll reconvene here in just a couple minutes to continue the discussion. Yeah, thank you. I'll just wait. Yeah. Refresh your tea, Akim. Okay. Thanks, thanks a lot. That was really great. I made some notes on those docs. Those are all available on the EFA website, the project reports. Um, most of it, yes, yeah, so. Okay, <laughs> all right, I will circulate that. In any event. I mean, I can also send you the PowerPoint, there are the links on it then. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so again, everybody, we're just gonna get up and stretch for a sec and reconvene in, in a couple minutes. Any, uh, Akim, if you, I wanna give you, afford you a chance to stretch your legs after talking for oh, an hour. I mean, I, I, <laughs> we can go on. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, that was a courtesy for you. So. My, my uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm really, I'm really ashamed. I didn't know about Wetzis. I mean, a, I'm a Dutch citizen now, so I should know it. But it's up in Leovard, and I didn't realize it. Yeah, no. that that's really interesting. I, I, I didn't know anything about that. Thanks. No, it's a very good place you know, and um, a very interesting approach. You know, so. Yeah, I, I very, very stimulating approach. But it was in my back. Well, not different province, so I guess we don't count that. But I should have known about that. I don't know why. I didn't, but any thanks. Yeah, I'm looking at their yeah, website. It the, by chance, you know, I didn't know about it either. So <laughs> one of my colleagues found it. So, yeah. Yeah, I can. We, it, uh, Tim Sutter has a question for you. Tim, do you, do you have your hand up? Yes, question? yes, I do, if I may. Please. And it's kind of a comment, and just to see what your reaction would be. Mm -hmm. um, what what I would uh, suggest is that. The messaging about nitrogen is uh, maybe a, a little bit difficult for, for many people to follow. Mm -hmm. When you have a situation that at the low end of the scale, basically nitrogen mining gives you very high nitrogen use efficiency. Mm -hmm. yeah. And at least, you know, my gut feeling is efficiency is what we strive for. So I want the highest efficiency. And yet you show these graphs and they show that in uh, situations where zero nitrogen is applied, you've got very high efficiency because you're measuring it as nitrogen in, yeah. uh, or what is it, nitrogen uh, output over input. Yeah. And then there's a sweet spot between uh, 50 and 90% uh, that you, actually that's where we want to be. So is there any better way to describe the situation with nitrogen rather than using this term nitrogen use efficiency? <laughs> yeah, um, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, there, there, are, there are many different definitions of nitrogen use efficiency already. You know, this is just one, you know, so you, you can probably find five or six others and more specific ones that deal with this fertilizer efficiency only. Uh, so, uh, and now it's uh, not, not all of them are much easier to understand either. You know? So I've, I've become a bit sort of complacent uh, about this in the sense to say, okay, you know, whatever it is, uh, as long as we can find a way to explain it, you know, in some form, you know. And what we have found with this particular indicator, and okay, I have to say this was developed by a, a group of us in Europe. Yeah? And in Europe, you don't have that situation that you have that or very high efficiency because there's no input because there's no there's always input. <laughs> so that makes it easier. You know? So, but um, what we have found is that uh, the way we show this, uh, if you show people uh, sort of like a, a green zone where you can be in or should be in, you know that resonates quite well. And they're using this now, for example, also in discussions with the European Commission, uh, who has set the goal as, the, as part of the new farm, uh, uh, farm to fork strategy for the EU, they want to halve nitrogen pollution in, in, in the European Union by 2030. 
they don't exactly know what they mean with this. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but essentially, that's that's the political goal. And now we're using the efficiency indicator in the discussions with them to say, look, you know, uh, you need to use an indicator of this kind or something like that to really watch whether you're making progress in a certain direction, you know. Because if you just say, let's reduce pollution, but what does that mean? You know, what pollution, where, how much, what are we starting with, you know? So, so we have found that it's actually be useful for these purposes because it's still relatively simple, but I, I, I agree uh, the problem lies uh, at the at the African end of the curve, you know, <laughs> where you seem to have massively high efficiencies, uh, which is actually the exact opposite of what you want, you know. So I have not found a better way of expressing this. this is the I think it's fine as long as you have the opportunity to mm -hmm. explain, uh, as you did in the seminar, that these high efficiencies in the African case are due to, yeah. in effect, a mining of the soil. And that's yeah. not desirable. As long as you have that ability to do that. But I don't know, I'm afraid in some sound bites, you know, you may not have the opportunity to do that. So it'd be nice if there was a better way, but I appreciate the problem. It's interesting. And you, when you look at some of the, uh, uh, let's say, for example, how people have tried to implement uh, Sustainable Development Goal 2 and come up with an indicator for nutrients. They they often use an implicators which are far worse, which is fertilizer use as a whole. You know, what does that mean? <laughs> so, uh, so that makes it into uh, those things. You know, uh, even the Rainforest Alliance is a big uh, NGO which has a sustainable agriculture sort of certification program with companies. And about two and a half million farmers enrolled in this in the world. And you can buy sometimes stuff, cocoa, coffee, which has the Rainforest Alliance label on it. In that standard, the indicator for nutrient use is a fertilizer amount per hectare. So now, now I don't know how they rate this, you know. Is, is it better if you dump on a lot? You know? <laughs> so, you know, but that has made it into a sustainable agricultural standard. Yeah? because they didn't know better so i'm having a discussion with them right now to say look you can probably do this better you know <laughs> so, yeah these are simple things that you sometimes come across where you wonder you know where a lot of the even the scientific knowledge that we have uh, just hasn't made it into these things you know thank you very much can I, can I make a quick follow-up um, question on that, which is to, to use the Brazil example. I think there's another angle to this as well, which is, doesn't quite come out looking at the Africa versus Europe, which is in Brazil, I think you've got 80% of your nitrogen is coming from fixation uh, because you've got so many lagoons in the system. Um, so in that case, you can have a very high apparent nutrient use efficiency without mining. And it's so the fixation element needs to come into the metric as well. And that could be a that could be a big player. So I think again, I think we need to be even more careful than just saying it's a question of whether you're mining or not. Fixation is accounted for as an input in that indicator. So, oh, okay, fair enough. Okay. But uh, of course, you you never really know what exactly it is. You know, it's, it's but it's in there. Yes, yeah. it's in there already. Okay. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.